Welcome everyone to our fifth episode of Ruveni Real Talk. Uh, my guest today is Michael Stern, founder and CEO of JDS Development Group, a real estate development, construction and acquisition firm responsible for the creation of numerous notable residential hospitality and mixed use projects in New York City and in Miami. Michael has extensive expertise in design, construction and project management, as well as sales and branding. JDS has executed on some, some of the very creative and complex projects in the city, uh, such as 111 West 57th Street, which is the prominent 1400 foot high tower on 57th Street. In downtown Brooklyn, the dramatic DeKalb Avenue project, which uh, will become the tallest structure in New York City outside Manhattan. Walker Tower and Stella Tower, the Art Deco era conversions, which were originally designed by fame architect Ralph Walker. Um, Michael and JDS's track record also include notable projects such as the Fitzroy and Chelsea, the American Copper Building, buildings that is, and other prominent projects in Brooklyn and Miami. In 2015, Michael was named in the 40 under 40 list by Cranes New York. At that time, Michael, I believe, was only 35 years old. Uh, thank you, Michael, very much for joining us today. I really appreciate, appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. Uh, so thank you very much for making time for us and for our audience. My pleasure. Um, Happy to be let, here. Let me start, let me start with, um, in, in 2013, there was an interview by the New York Times. Uh, I, I believe it was Vivian Marino that interviewed you. And at the time you said you had approximately 18 projects in stages of planning and development. Now, I believe that at the time you were about 33 or 34 years old. Um, she asked at the end of the interview, what do you do for fun? And, and your answer was, I work. Now, we're 10 years later, you've done a lot. And my question is, is work still fun for you? Yeah, it's a good question. Work's still fun um, on some days. Uh, in different parts of the cycle, it's uh, not as much fun, uh, clearly. Um, but the parts that drive me um, are still fun. You know, I love creating tangible um, buildings and projects that have a long lasting impact. Uh, hopefully after I'm gone, they'll still be there and um, with a lot of architectural integrity. And we're trying to create really iconic quality buildings that uh, last generations. You started quite early, right? Um, right out of high school, I think uh, you you went to Florida and you were doing some uh, new development in Florida. Was it mostly construction or was it development? Yeah, so one of the things I like personally about the development business is unlike a lot of other things, there there is not one path in. You know, people get into the business, they're ex-brokers, they're ex-real estate lawyers, it was a family business, they come from finance. My path in was construction, nuts and bolts. I went to Florida um, very young and I, I learned how to build. I wasn't a principal yet. I was just working um, as a project manager for other people, um, understanding you know, how buildings are put together inside out, where the problems are, um, understanding uh, the sequence, the inefficiencies um, that you know, drive construction, which is inherently a very risky, complex proposition. Um, so my way in initially was just fundamentally understanding construction, which is different than some other developers. And was it was it mostly uh, uh, single family homes in Florida? No. So I started as a project manager doing high rise for other people. And at the same time, kind of as a side gig, I would do spec homes, you know, one or two at a time um, while working as a PM for for another developer. So I was learning how to build high rise and then kind of testing the theory on a smaller scale on my own little projects on the side. Um, and then once I grew um, comfortable enough, uh, after a couple of years, I started doing first more spec homes, then townhouse projects, and then kind of up the chain to mid rise and high rise and kind of followed a similar path. I came to New York in 2002 and started doing large scale low rise housing projects between I think 2002 and 2006, I built over a 1000 homes in various outer borough neighborhoods that are not architecturally glamorous, we'll just say. So your first project was at the one in Gowanus in Brooklyn? 
No, we actually built in East New York, Flatbush, Hillcrest, Far Rockaway, um, hundreds and hundreds of homes um, that were kind of anonymous and, um, you know, before anybody had ever paid any attention to what we were doing, we were just building tract housing, basically. Right. But I'm sure that gave you an amazing experience in terms of construction, the nuances of construction, the good and bad, um, hiring crews and buying jobs. Yeah, you know, uh, what I learned doing low rise housing um, was, you know, building 50 townhouses is actually just as hard, if not harder, as building one bigger, you know, 50 unit apartment building. Um, it's the same thing. It's the same permit process. You still need to go through the entire gauntlet of getting a new building built in New York City from, you know, entitlements, permitting, design, you know, getting a TCO, getting getting it all the way through. Um, it's just more efficient to amortize the time and the effort over a bigger building. So today I, I, I tend to do less projects, but they tend to be bigger because it's just a better use of resources and time if we can make sense of it. I'd rather do a, a 500,000 square foot building than 500,000 foot buildings. It's sure. a lot less work. Well, you say less projects. How many projects do you have going on right now? Today, we probably have eight or nine in different eight or stages. Eight nine, and that's, yeah. that's less projects. Less projects, but they tend to be they tend to be larger scale. So I'm just being sarcastic. I mean, it's eight or nine projects. For that to be considered less, that's like a huge portfolio uh, at any at any level. Yeah, uh, but you so have to remember that different projects are kind of at different gestation periods. Let's say, right? So you have some projects that are, you know, you just bought it. It's in acquisition phase, or there's still tenants in a building you plan on knocking down, and you're just doing design. Uh, other projects, you're you're doing final TCO punch list, like you know we're delivering a building right now in South Florida, a condominium called Monad Terrace. Um, we're in the middle of doing closing, so construction is largely wrapped, and we're doing a punch list closeout process, and still some stuff to do there. But you know it's on the list, but it's it's in the home stretch. Whereas uh, you know another counterpoint, we just broke ground recently on. Um, a project called One Southside Park in Brickell, which we literally are just starting to soil mix. We're just at the beginning. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, you have to really look at the phase of each project uh, to make it manageable. Mm -hmm. What would you consider was your like uh, breakthrough large project in Manhattan, the first one? Um, you know, we, we bought and sold a few buildings in Manhattan that we were kind of threatening to develop, but ended up, uh, trading out of and, and making a few bucks. And then um, we did Walker Tower, which was, I bought Walker Tower in 2009. I signed the contract to buy it. We did a two year sale lease back to Verizon and we delivered that building, I believe in October of 2013, we finished it. We started construction in July of 11. And um, I think that was the first building that people really paid any attention to. Um, I guess because there just wasn't that much going on in the market at that time. I think really the only major buildings going on were our project, uh, there you go, and 157, which was under construction at the time. And we also did something very unique there, which was really push the envelope on unit size. That was at a time where, you know, the average unit size was probably, you know, a 1500 square foot two bedroom. And we pushed 3,500 square foot average apartments in that building. And everybody who looked at our initial projections, you know, their head exploded. They couldn't get their head around um, the prices we thought we would get. I mean, we were underwriting, I think we underwrote 1,600 a foot when we first bought the building. I think you and I sat down actually, That's before right. I even started construction. I think we talked about, you know, if we really nail it, we'll do 1,600 a foot, you know, and maybe we could dream about 1,800. And I think we, I think we blended sponsor units at 4,300 a foot in that building. That, that's funny you say that. I remember that so well. Um, Walker Tower came, uh, it was like the perfect storm in terms of timing. So you and I met in 2009 and I remember walking the building with you. Um, let me just uh, bring this up. I wanna, I wanna show this. It was a phenomenal, I had never seen a building like that when I walked the building. It was just like, it, it, it was like a whole world on its own. You know what I mean? 
the yeah. the architecture was incredible the scale was amazing the the views the exposure yeah, the funny the thing about that building is you know it was widely marketed because verizon was the owner and they have to run quite a process of um you know offering it for sale so it was marketed by newmark knight frank and every everybody and their mother every developer in town had walked the building and when we bought it it barely had any windows it was full of telephone switches it was you know, the building hadn't been cleaned or maintained in 80 years. And it just, it was a really depressing looking building. And, um, you know, just no one got it. So as great as, as we look back and we say, how did, it's so obvious it has huge ceiling heights and amazing views. It's the, was the tallest building west of 6th Avenue. It's Art Deco. Every developer in town passed on it. They just right, but their it was also it. different. It was also a different time. I mean, the environment today and in the environment of 2013 was very different than the environment of 2008. We were just coming out of a great recession. There were no permits filed for like two to three years. Uh, there was hardly any inventory in the city, uh, new inventory. Yeah. Now, money has been um, the, the capital ability was increasing by the year from like 2010 all the way to 2013. There was a lot of capital sitting on the sidelines that hasn't been employed yet, deployed yet. And Bloomberg was running the city at the time and, and lifestyle changed a lot. And all of a sudden there was an explosion of demand. Uh, and what you built actually fitted perfectly. You were one of the, you know, very few buildings that actually came out around that time that sort of defined the golden era of new developments, if you will, right? I, I agree with Charles, that. 150 Charles is another example of a building yeah. like that. I was I was finishing the building that I was doing on the Upper West Side called the Laureate. The Laurel, yeah, the Laureate. Yeah, I remember and, that and too. Laureate, uh, the developer, which was Stahl at the time, took a huge chance. It was Stahl, um, they, they took a huge chance on on unit mix, we built very large apartments. And when we're coming out of the recession, that was what's in demand. Large, you know, families wanted bigger spaces. Families that had moved out to the suburbs were coming back into the city and buying uh, units in the city. And there was a lot of foreign money here, a lot of capital. So- Well, the, it, it was a perfect storm of supply and demand. And we were kind of an island of supply, you know, in a sea of demand. Um, but, you know, aside from the supply demand issues, there was very much a pro-business sentiment in the city. You're right in, in honing in on the, the, the policies of the Bloomberg administration, which were very friendly. Um, it felt like, you know, capital was welcome here. And that goes also, uh, it felt like foreign capital was welcome here. There was money flowing, you know, from the Middle East. There was a lot of money here. There was, you know, no restrictions on the outflow of capital from China at that time. And Chinese capital had just begun to trickle into the market. Then there was still a lot of Russian capital and Israeli capital, and it just felt like, um, you know, if you had product, you know, at Walker Tower, we gave no concession whatsoever. You know, you a buyer paid. You know, there was no negotiating on mansion, on transfer, on uh, you know. Well, you, you better buy, or you're going to lose the apartment. That's it. It was. That's it. And and honestly, if I had to describe the goal of marketing real estate and, and the mark of success of a broker is you need to convince people that there's urgency. That's what you're in the business of creating. You're creating the sense that something is finite and if you don't buy it, it's going to go. And in certain markets, it's, it's just impossible to do. Right. And in a, in a, in a successful campaign, you know, that that's really what you're creating. You're creating a sense of urgency if you can do it. Right. You need, so to, make, you need building... to spur people to act. Sure. So a building like yours, like Walker Tower and like, you know, 150 Charles at the time, 56 Leonard was another example of a building that came out around the same time that was just sitting on the sidelines for a long time and, and wasn't developed. And then parts of 157 West 57th Street and then 432 Park Avenue. But that happened at the time where the market was just kept moving up and people were buying. And the perception was that if you don't buy today, you're going to lose out. So people were buying into that. I think marketing. Exactly. Itself, and, you know, I'll tell you something else. Um, if you look at where the Miami market is now and Palm Beach market, that's how the Miami Beach and the Palm Beach market is today. If I told you that it would be like that today, a year ago, you would have laughed. The market was was very, very slow, especially for condominiums. The market was slow. And now all of a sudden, um, you know, the volume's incredible. There is no supply because nobody was building. And the truth is developers need to build in bad times. 
um, to have supply when the times are good. Well, how do you explain the market in Miami right now? Um, is it is it because people from New York are moving down to Florida? Because uh, is it other urban you know areas in the United States are, are possibly losing wealthy clients that are moving down to Florida? Is is, is Miami going through some type of a transformation that hasn't happened before? You know, I think so. I've been in Miami, you know, for decades and Miami's always been a bit of a boom bust cycle um, historically, um, but it does feel a little bit different this time. And I, I do think we're at an inflection point in Miami. You know, the notion that the the older, you know, CEO wants to move to Florida to for better income tax treatment, but but a state tax treatment and a better lifestyle that's been going on forever. That's not a new trend. The difference now is he's moving his company to Florida, which right. opens up, you know, a, a wider economic spectrum of residents, you know, the, the service people and every, everybody else who, you know, from the bottom up. And that's fundamentally different, I think, than before. And obviously, you know, COVID uh, had a bunch of people leaving urban areas, but I'm not one who's a believer that people are going to abandon urban areas and there'll be urban flight long term. I, I don't buy it at all. I still believe in in developing dense mixed use projects near mass transit. That is going to be the future. That trend that's been happening for decades towards um, you know rapid transit zones and density isn't going to all of a sudden retreat in my opinion, even though it paused due to a, a you know a force majeure event of COVID. Um, it's going to come back, you know, we're going to either get to uh, a, a tipping point with vaccinations or herd immunity or whatever is going to happen. I have an incredible confidence and faith in the lousy memories of American people. You know, if you just look not that long ago, you know, we had the tragic events of 9-11 and everybody said, no one's going to get on commercial airplanes. No one's going to want to live in tall buildings and the financial district's going to, you know, just be a ghost town. And since then, the financial districts become a real residential neighborhood. Um, we saw the biggest boom in commercial aviation following 9-11. That was their best decade ever. And we built more super tall skyscrapers in New York than ever before uh, following 9-11. You know, Hurricane Sandy, everybody was going to abandon the coast. Waterfront values have not only rebound, they've accelerated. You know, you can just go time and time again. Um, we don't have a good memory, and I don't think that's a bad thing, um, because it prevents us from overreacting to very short-term moves. But I do think that, you know, there are policy issues that you're seeing really drive people out. I don't think it's as much of an urban flight issue as it is just bad policy by certain um, tax authorities and, and others, right? You're seeing a massive flight from California for all sorts of not just tax policies, but just over-regulating the business environment. And then you see um, a lot of folks leaving New, Jer New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. And that's, uh, I think, going to continue. Um, I think that that is going to continue, but I'm very, very bullish on where New York's going to go. I think we'll have a little bit of a pause, but um, it's going to come roaring back as it always does. Yeah, it's interesting um, what actually happened in the past 12 months. You know, when COVID hit, the first few months were really very, very dark, right? I mean, we didn't know where things were going. And then around the summer, we had all these demonstrations in the city, and it just added to just a, a very negative feeling, possibly about New York. I know that Barry Stern, like with who I, I think you're um, you were associated with, actually uh, business-wise, you know, made a statement a few months ago how um, New York is going down, how little by little, you know, services and um, are going to deteriorate, the police is going to stop showing up, and things are just going to deteriorate to a very, very dark place. Um, and it was kind of dark, you know, that type of mentality, that type of talk, because every headline, you know, that you read, um, every news about New York kind of, you know, showed, showed possibly what the future would look like in a, in a very pessimistic way. And then the summer was over, and Labor Day uh, came in, and all of a sudden, things just escalated in a crazy way by huge demand from local money, very affluent families who did not move out, who were not planning on moving out, who had been sitting on the sidelines for the past few years, not purchasing because prices were very high, and now are jumping into the market because they were able to pick up great deals. Now, 
I can tell you that, you know, from my experience, just selling high end, um, I'm lucky enough to have some really good projects and very high end projects that really benefited across the board from that type of demographic. And the numbers are astounding. I mean, if you compare this to last year before COVID, um, you know, before COVID, it's just, it's incredible what the change is like. Listen, I, I hear you and I agree. What people tend to forget, we, we focus very much that we just came off a, a COVID year and it was kind of a dead year and all that, but the market was really weak for two years, at least in front of COVID, right? It's not like the market was booming and then a bucket of cold water was splashed on it called COVID. That, that's not actually what happened. The market was kind of stagnant. It was kind of oversupplied, especially on kind of tertiary locations that probably weren't worthy of some of the asking prices in the first place. And a lot of that had to shake out and it's starting to shake out. Um, and there's no, there's been no new housing starts really this year or last year or the year before of any. Well, it's down, it's down like 70, 80%, right? The number of permits. Yeah, and investment sales volume for land and developable sites are, are way down. So the truth is, um, New York might have needed a little bit of a pause on supply to let let stuff absorb, and and that could lead to a healthier market overall, right? Things are things are absorbing now because it's undersupplied. The talk was how saturated supply was a couple of years ago. That's all everybody talked about, and now enough time goes by with no new starts. And you have to understand also that um, a lot of folks look at are looking at real estate again as kind of a, an inflation hedge. They like right. all hard assets are strong right now. Um, so you're seeing some strength again. You are seeing uh, concessions still higher than I'd like, but the volume um, has really bounced back nicely. And we're starting to see a lot of traffic in our New York projects. So from what we're seeing, there's, there's activity in two different sectors of the market, mostly, right? The, most of the activity is like, Something like 90% of all transactions are under $3 million. Co-ops and condos throughout the city, under $3 million, right? And then at the very high end, um, you know, it's mostly new developments that are selling large spaces. It's not resale listings, but that only represents about uh, 10% or 15% of the market. The, the in-between sector of let's call it four to maybe $8 million or $9 million is still lagging behind. There's still a lot of inventory in that uh, sector that's not really moving that well, not being absorbed. And I think it's because of the kind of product that was built in the past two, three years, um, which is which is currently sitting. The so the question is, do you think there's an inventory surplus uh, at this point? And, and how long would it take to absorb, considering that there's still a pipeline of projects that haven't even launched? So I think it's, I think you have to kind of go neighborhood by neighborhood. I think there are um, particular neighborhoods that are oversupplied and others that are undersupplied, right? I think if you look at, you know, the West Chelsea market probably has the most supply of new development um, compared to demand. I think there's there's a lot of inventory in West Chelsea and um, there's still, you know, a bunch that hasn't really delivered. So I think West Chelsea maybe, you know, needs a little time to shake out supply. But again, I think the best thing that could have happened to West Chelsea is a bit of a pause on, on the frenetic pace of, of new buildings coming up because um, there's very high quality product in that market. Some of the best architecture and design in the city. Um, the neighborhood has to develop a little bit. It'd be nice to see some retail support there. Obviously retail is suffering everywhere, but um, that neighborhood needs to mature a little bit. And I think a bit of a pause on supply is not a bad thing. I think the Upper East Side um, actually is undersupplied. Um, which you're seeing, you know, as an example, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, the Bra uh, Bradford. Uh, Mickey Naftali's project. Mickey Naftali's project and Todd and Terrence's Branson, project yeah. has has seen some real uh, traction. So I think there's there's room to run a little bit for the right product on the Upper East Side. There isn't a lot of product in in quality, the quality Midtown locations. There's still demand there. You know, the 57th Street Carter, I think, has always been misunderstood. I think for a time, um, the kind of the real estate rags like to write about a perceived oversupply. But when you really looked at it and distilled it down, it was really only a couple of hundred units in the entire corridor that had these premium Central Park views. And I think there was a, a big misconception on this uh, supply issue there. Um, if you count up all the units, 432, 520, um, the Nordstrom Tower, 157 in our building, 
Um, it's just not that many units. And then you count. Well, let's, talk, let's talk about 11, uh, about 57th Street. Your, your, your project, Steinway, just reported recently a few big sales. Um, I, think, uh, I think there was a $50 million uh, penthouse that sold recently, right? Which is yeah, we, 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 did, we did quite a few deals during the pandemic. Um, I wouldn't say we you know, did a deal every day, but we steadily sold at very strong numbers, even during the pandemic. Um, which to me is just a flight to quality. And again, we talked about, you know, creating the sense that it's finite. I mean, it's very finite. There are only 46 units in the tower, um, you know, only a number are left and it's the 50 yard line of Central Park. There'll never be another building that has unobstructed views that's dead center of Central Park. The image you have on the screen is kind of the, the perfect uh, image for this conversation, right? Um, there's only a handful of units. So if you want to be in that premier position with that Central Park premium in a building with uh, incredible ceiling heights, views, finishes, architectural pedigree, um, this, is, this is never going to happen again. So buyers have recognized that. And um, we've done some deals. We did a, a deal in excess of 50. We did a couple of deals in the 30s. Um, so there's still strength there. Even at the very bottom of the pandemic, we saw those kind of deals. And traffic has only picked up since as the sense of recovery is starting to um, become more pervasive and, and people feel better about New York and about uh, buying real estate generally. How, let's talk about this building for a sec. This, this is, this is I, mean, I, I recall when the news came out that you were planning to build this building non-union. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, and I remember some of the headlines, you know, there was, uh, who was it um, that was quoted uh, Gary LaBarbera, right? Who's the president of the Building and Construction Trades Council. Mm -hmm. he, he said something like, you know, this is a needle in a haystack and experiment more than anything else. If I, you know, I think that if I quote him correctly. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, how do you, how do you even, you know, obviously this is built now, but looking back, would you have done it the same way? Build non-union? Yeah, so the answer is, yeah, we, we build open shop. And, and, and I'll tell you that when we started building open shop in New York, when we started building high rise complex projects in New York, um, the way we do, uh, people thought it couldn't be done. People thought we were a little crazy. Um, and, you know, it's only a few years later. And now you can't find me a residential building built in New York that's built union. Even the uh, residential at Hudson Yards is being built open shop name a developer, uh, a, a large scale developer um, from, you know, the Extels of the world and the related to the world and the Tishman Spires of the world. Everybody builds all residential buildings in New York City today, open shop. But you were the first one. I mean, this is yes. a 14, this is a 1400 foot tall building. Were yeah. you, I think we, you, all we, the names we, you just mentioned are doing, you look, know, they're building great buildings, very large scale buildings, but you were the first one to do this non-union. That's, that's a ballsy, that's a very ballsy move. I mean, how do you, let me get into that. You, you're very involved with all aspects of construction, right? Very, very involved. We live and breathe the details. Um, we were the pioneer. It wasn't easy. I'm not going to, you know, downplay it. We had to take uh, quite a lot of flack. I, you know, actually have a, a, a nice relationship with Gary LaBarba, despite us being on other uh, opposite sides of the table. We've met many times had lots of nice conversations. He's a, a perfectly nice guy and I wish him well. Um, it's not a, it's not as adversarial as it might sometimes seem from the media and from the outside. Um, but we just refused to um, be told that we had to do something less efficiently than we knew we could do it. We knew we could we can build these large scale projects without some of the entrenched entitlements that bogged down traditionally New York construction. I mean, if you look at construction costs, not just in New York, but in all the kind of dense urban centers, construction costs keep rising. It, the, the pace of the rise of construction costs, just in the last 10 years in New York City, construction costs are up something like 35%. Um, that's outpacing wage growth, why, inflation. Why? Why is that? Is that because of raw materials? Is that uh, labor or does insurance have a lot to do with this? What, it's, where's it's, the... it's, it's almost always mostly driven by labor. Material, materials you know, have fluctuated. There were periods of time where steel prices were very high, concrete steadily risen. Um, but it's, it's almost always, the answer is almost always labor. 
Um, that's what drives most of the cost. There is an insurance element. You know, in New York, we have this uh, very silly law called the scaffold law, which really drives insurance prices. And then just for anyone who doesn't know, if somebody comes to work, uh, you know, drunk and high and falls off the third step of a ladder and injures himself, we as owner or contractor are not allowed to even proportionally defend ourselves. We are strictly liable for, for any of those types of falls. So that really drives the uh, workers' comp and general liability claims through the roof. So New York has the highest insurance rates for construction in, in the country. And, you know, the scaffold law is something that's always been advocated for by the unions. Um, I think it needs to be reformed, but it's insurance. But the answer is labor. It's always labor. Is the construction cost in New York City, uh, is it the highest in the country? I'm not sure if it's the highest. I mean, it's certainly up there. Um, you know, the, the cities the, that are really expensive to build in, you know, New York, of course, San Francisco is an expensive place to build and a difficult place to build. Um, you know, I think, again, you learn very quickly that the local politics in a particular place has an incredible effect on pricing. You know, if you take a place like Florida or Texas, um, those places are some of the least expensive places to build in the country high rise. Um, but, you know, New York, Boston, LA, San Francisco, Philadelphia, these are, these are Washington, DC, these are expensive places to build. The, the cost, the construction cost, does it affect your financing? Yeah, it affects everything. I mean, sure. You know, uh, you have to make it pencil and you have to convince the entire capital stack from, you know, the equity up, up through the debt that uh, this is going to be a successful business plan. And um, it's a, you know, it's a fair reward and likelihood of success adjusted for risk. So let me ask you, I mean, for developers, I'm trying to look, there is a certain breed of people called developers, I think, right? And we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but they're here to develop. And if you put together a performer and your construction cost comes out to let's say 525 a foot, right? And on a regular 20 story building, I'm not talking about a 1400 square foot yep. building, but um, but in a regular building and then, and then and, and, and costs have risen, let's say by 10 to 15 or 20%. So now your cost is 575 a foot, right? Are you not going to build or not get financing because that extra cost, is that gonna make or break your doing a deal? You know, it could because some lenders will say, you know what, I want to, I want my last dollar to be at X per square foot. So it's very nice that your costs went up $50 a square foot. You guys have to plug that with equity because we're just, we're at our number, right? Um, it's not a matter of, you know, adjusting pro rata, the loan to cost, because I'm just not comfortable being above a certain price per square foot on my last dollar for my loan. So now you have to plug that gap on the equity side and, you know, depending on the capability of the equity, um, that could be the difference between having a complete cap stack and, and not, you know, or it could be the difference between a sponsor saying, hey, I'm going to take MES, but now that MES introduces risk because if I have a schedule problem and, you know, I mistime it, that MES might eat my equity alive. So, it, you know, small differences in costs can have a ripple effect, even though it seems manageable at the time. We all know um, construction isn't like manufacturing a widget, right? If you're manufacturing, you know, a widget, they all come off the assembly line the same, you know what it costs, it's consistent, the machine puts them out the same way. Um, none of us are surprised when a construction project, you know, runs over a little and takes a little longer. We're actually surprised if it doesn't. It's right. the nature of construction, unfortunately. Hopefully one day that'll get solved. Hopefully some technology will be introduced to start to kind of normalize and, and make it more predictable and, and improve that risk. But right now, you know, construction's built by human beings in the elements, in the dense urban jungle that we live in. And, and all of those variables just inherently create unpredictability. So small changes in cost or schedule, I'd argue that missing schedule is actually more important than minor changes in cost because the, the cost of time on a major real estate project, you know, interest carry, property taxes, insurance, general conditions um, will actually eat you alive a lot faster than a minor budget hiccup. Which, which happens, right? So you've been doing this now for over a decade in the city, right? You've been building, and, and you just mentioned a lot in terms of all the challenges and uh, that, that a developer has to go through, whether it's community or city guidelines or regulations or 
financing, construction costs. How do you compare the developing in the city today to developing in the city 10 years ago? Um, I think it's uh, I think it's become more and more difficult. And I think those barriers to entry are not only higher, but they're growing. And, and you know, you could look at that as a as a developer and say, well, that's a good thing because if the barriers to entry remain high, that makes my value as a developer, you know, even higher because I don't think I'll have a big competitive set, you know, coming in and 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 eating my lunch. So that's one thing. The problem is you have a rise of nimbyism big time in New York in a way that we never had before. You have community groups, you know, who used to complain a little bit about kind of anything. There's no project that you build in New York that you that somebody doesn't like. But now they've kind of weaponized the court system and they've figured out that there are a lot of lower court judges that'll just do wacky things and they could delay projects for a very long time. You've seen a rash of nimbyism and judicial activism, the kind that you see in San Francisco or in LA or other places like that that's been used to kind of artificially slow development and artificially keep supply low. Um, those forces have started to really become commonplace in New York, where one of the things that made New York, New York was if you had a site that was quote unquote, as of right, you can really rely on your as of right zoning. And that provided a lot of stability to the development market in New York and to the lenders and the equity investors to say, all right, as long as I stay within my lane of, of what I am legally entitled to on this property, no one's going to bother me. I can go pull a permit and go build that project relatively easily. And it's not a discretionary process, right? New York doesn't have a design review board for an as of right development. You can make the building as pretty or as ugly as you like, make it any color you like. And as long as you're within your legal rights, you can build it. That's a good thing for our system. But unfortunately um, today, community groups are, are finding unscrupulous lawyers to hurl frivolous, meritless lawsuits challenging as of right projects. And they're finding a receptive audience with certain lower court judges that are just making bad rulings that we need then the appellate division then has to overrule. But that costs a developer a year or two sometimes. And we've seen it quite a lot. You see it with Extel on 66th Street, mm -hmm. with SJP on the Lincoln Square, whatever development. We see around. it. Yeah, yeah. Our, our projects on the Lower East Side, which we just finally won um, our land use cases after, uh, you know. That, is that the one on Cherry Street? Yeah, so we, we went through a couple of years of a debate on what was a project that complied in all respects with underlying zoning and, you know, community groups successfully um, throttled it for a couple of years. So the appellate division has been making really thoughtful and reasoned um, decisions. And, and I think for the most part has up, the inward rezoning was another one. Um, where I think the appellate division have, have kind of been the adults in the room and have been doing the right thing. Um, but, you know, to weaponize the law and just cost the developer a lot of time and money, that's not good for the development environment in New York. And it just, again, adds complexity and cost. And, and it's something I'm concerned about. And, and I think so that- So why do you think, I mean, we have elections, local elections in November of this year and I think um, I think the the, con the decision of that elections right is going to have certain consequences on possibly the future of development. Do you see it like that? Absolutely. Look, local politics uh, almost always matter more than national politics to development. Right? Development, uh, a local game. I mean, yes, you see some kind of big demographic shifts that are bigger, and 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 items like that. But generally speaking, I mean, development is a local game. Who the mayor is matters, who the city council speaker matters, who the local council people matter. I mean, you saw, you know, Sunset Park, you saw a, a rezoning killed that kind of made no sense. You saw the Amazon deal get killed. You know, we really need to get away from this hostile environment to business because um, just it's just bad for New York. Uh, we're not advocating for sort of uncontrolled uh, rampant development or uh, complete lack of community input. I think there's a place for a community conversation. And I think there's a place to have a discussion with a, a local council member about, you know, improvements and, you know, is the project too big, too small? Can we improve the subway? Can we put money in the park? Can we look at, you know, traffic impact issues? Those are all valid uh, items when they're done in good faith. But as I said, when it's sort of, 
uh, just weaponized to, to say no to everything, I think that's problematic. What are your thoughts about uh, the future of 421A? Well, 421A, as we know it is, is dead. We've got Affordable New York now, right? Um, I think the Affordable New York program is workable. I think that it's still new enough that not a lot of buildings under Affordable New York have kind of made it all the way through the construction cycle and finished. A couple have. Um, I think the program is, you know, not perfect, but workable. We're building an Affordable New York project right now in downtown Brooklyn, uh, Nine DeKalb, which will be the tallest building in Brooklyn. I think it'll actually be the tallest in building in Brooklyn in probably around, I don't know, four to six weeks if all tracks. Um, like, is that is that the tallest building uh, in New York City outside Manhattan? It is, yeah. It is. It's, it's, it's over um, a thousand feet tall. And and on Cherry Street, you also have a, an affordable component, right? We do. So a nine to Calb is a 70-30 affordable New York rental component with a condominium component above it. So it's about 425 rental units, about 150 condos on top of that, and a large uh, commercial component underneath. And then on Cherry Street, we'll have a 75-25 affordable New York uh, rental tower, about a thousand feet tall, 660 units. Uh-huh. Are you at all concerned about supply in that uh, submarket in Brooklyn? So here's what's interesting. You know, we we feel really good about our delivery year. You know, we're going to deliver in in early 23. Um, there, as discussed, there's really been no meaningful new starts in the last you know year and change. And a lot of the the buildings coming out of the last cycle are are selling now, closing now, absorbing now. Um, we think we're going to kind of be again on that island of supply when we deliver. And we also think fundamentally our building is just um, head and shoulders above anything that's ever been built in the borough before. You know, this isn't, um, this isn't a building that's uh, about price. At any price, it's the best building you can buy an apartment in just in terms of ceiling heights, views, finishes, amenities, and adjacencies. You know, you're sitting on a couple of subway lines, better better access to, to Manhattan than many parts of Manhattan, given the proximity to the subway. And then you were adjacent to the City Point retail, which is fantastic with the best food hall in Brooklyn and Trader Joe's and a movie theater and Target. And there's just a, a great adjacency, a great story. Um, you know, you can buy in this building um, the kind of views and quality that you're seeing on the 57th Street corridor with the kind of master of the universe views, ceiling, ceiling heights, finishes uh, for, you know, a fraction, a quarter, a third. Uh, it's an incredible value proposition. You know, in the old days, people went to Brooklyn because it was cheaper. People are choosing Brooklyn over Manhattan now for lifestyle, Style. for culture. People yeah. regularly cross shop downtown uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn all the time now. You know, th those bridges and tunnels aren't artificial barriers anymore. Sure. Um, we, we're having, you know, the, the resi market definitely has been doing better, I guess, in terms of absorption and, and it seems in terms of demand. There's definitely negotiations taking place, but there is capital in the street and people are committing to New York and people are purchasing. Um, it, it's almost a little surreal when you compare that to the commercial res, to the commercial real estate world, right? Because it seems like we're going through an economic meltdown when it comes to the hospitality business, uh, multifamily portfolios, and and you know, I don't know, it's thirty to thirty-five percent vacancy in many of them. Retail, I'm not sure what's going to happen. What what the magic formula is for retail, and also commercial and office buildings. Uh, there's been some proposals about repositioning of uh, hotels into Resi, uh, which I personally am involved now with a large one um, that is going to be repositioned as uh, Resi because it just doesn't function as a hotel anymore. Uh, and, and also commercial buildings. What are your thoughts about that? The commercial and office buildings, uh, the proposal of possibly turning them into residential conversions. Uh, for developers to be incentivized through the city through 421As or some type of, of an incentive program to do that? I, th I think if it's the devil's in the details, but I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good idea generally. I think you need incentives on 421A or Affordable New York, but you also need incentives or, or inducements on multiple dwelling law, law relief because a lot of these office buildings have deep plates and it's very hard to make the legal light and air work in a lot of these buildings so you might need some some uh you know 
relief on on legal light and air and other things to deal with these deep floor plates. But I think there are a lot of buildings that are very outdated. Um, they've outlived their useful purpose as office buildings and and would make good residential buildings. But um, many of the buildings are pretty useless as residential buildings because they're just too deep. Sure. You think, uh, obviously, I, I'm very bullish on, on New York as well. I've been through the cycles for the past 30 years, and I've always seen it back. It's just a matter of time before it does, and then it comes back roaring, just like it did, uh, I believe, in 2012 and 13. Uh, but COVID did, did, a, did do a number on us, right? And do you think COVID changed the concept of offices, um, demand for larger offices by companies, I do believe that people will come back. I believe in the creative aspect of the city like no, no other, but do you think the office market changed? Yeah, so there's two sides, right, of that argument. One is that, you know, remote work is gonna be more prevalent and people will thus need less space. The other argument is that people won't wanna be as dense, uh, that, you know, the kind of square feet per employee that constantly been driven downward is gonna, come back up and thus companies will want more space. Uh, my take on it is I think it'll, I think the office market will be fine. Um, like multifamily will be fine, but it's going to hurt for a little while. I think the multi will take uh, at least a year to recover, to peel through all the concession, if not two. And um, the office, you know, I think the office is going to be fine. I really do. People still want to be here. It's still the financial capital of the world. And, you know, if we get a, a change in leadership um, and a change in sentiment in terms of New York City being open for business, I think everybody's going to want to come back here. Um, I think we're, like I said, a year or two, it'll, it'll, it'll hurt. But I think year three is going to be a boom year. Cool. So let's run. talk about you for a couple of minutes, right? You're the youngest developer that I know. Uh, doing what you're doing at such a, an amazing scale here in Manhattan and Brooklyn, and you're working in Miami as well. We haven't touched on a proposal that you have for Penn Station, but that was incredible, I thought, what you put together. Um, and, and you're doing a lot, and you're still very young. I mean, what are you, 40 now, 41? 41. So yeah. you have ways to go. You have done a lot, and that a lot means... You know, it can it weighs heavy on people, right? In our industry, physically, psychologically, mentally, it can really wear you down. I mean, the stress, the responsibility, the obligation. You have an amazing company and a big company with a lot of employees. That must be with you every second of the day, from when you wake up to when you go to sleep. You're 40 years old. You can retire today, not do anything else, in terms of new projects, and you probably still would have done more than most developers out there. Um, you know, who might even just be starting out today. So what's the 10 years, what's the next 10 years like? I mean, you've been doing this for a while in the city. If you look forward now, you still have energy in you. You still have that stamina to move forward, that creative spirit in you. You know what I do? Um, it definitely wears on you. It's not, uh, not an easy business. Um, definitely very stressful. It's a very complex business. You know, developers, we're kind of like quarterbacks. We're not necessarily the expert on anything. Um, we're really trying to bring together the best designers, engineers, finance folks, and kind of be the conductor in a symphony, right? Um, but it's a very risky business and there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of variables. And you know, one of the more frustrating things is you can execute a project perfectly as a developer. You could do everything right and some macro event that's totally out of your control can completely screw your business plan because it's really a business about timing. There really aren't bad deals necessarily, there's bad timing. You know, we talked a lot about, you know, hey, the timing was good for this because the supply metric was right. Well, I have utterly no control over that. So I could work on a, a condo project that I start today and I'm not delivering it for three or four years and I have no idea what environment I'm delivering into. If I'm delivering into a COVID environment, well, how do you underwrite the market being dead for the better part of 14, 16, 18 months. You can't, 
no one could underwrite that, which is why you're seeing, you know, a lot of a, a rash of UCC foreclosures and workouts and all sorts of things, because how could anybody predict that, right? So it's a, it's a difficult business in that way. But, you know, what gets me really excited is doing things that are impactful. I don't want to do kind of infill widget buildings to make a buck. I want to build something that's dynamic and, and actually moves the neighborhood. So if you look at, you know, American copper buildings, that's a very dynamic piece of contemporary architecture, two copper clad buildings with a sky bridge. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a big exclamation point in a sleepy neighborhood. And I like doing things like that where I could really make an impact and I could really change something. And now today, you know, the adjacent building was completely renovated. They put sweet green in, you're starting to see retail crop up. There's life there. Um, stuff like that excites me. You know, we're doing a project in uh, Brickell that's going to be a real game changer. It's got five different uses in it. Um, it's it's a large scale building, and it's going to take kind of a, the fringe part of Brickell and and recenter it and make it kind of the center. And in a way that you've kind of seen, you know, uh, where Nine DeKalb is in downtown Brooklyn, the center used to be further up Fulton Street, and now the center is really closer to that City Point area. The neighborhood's really shifted. Um, so I like to try to do things that are impactful beyond a spreadsheet. And I'm still excited about doing that. Who's, um, you know, there's a lot of legacy developers in the city that have done a lot to change the skyline and to change uh, neighborhoods and submarkets, right? I mean, when you look at the Zeckendorfs, the Litwins, the Goodsteins, the Millsteins, the Manichurians, and then maybe a different type of uh, developer like Harry Macklow, like Sheldon Solo, or, or Gary Barnett, right? Do you see yourself, um, your legacy uh, in line with these names, with these type of developers? And who, who's really your inspiration in terms of a developer? Yeah, I gotta tell you, I, I don't know, maybe it's cause I'm, 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 I'm 41, so I'm not a young developer anymore, as they say, but I'm, I'm, I'm certainly younger than some of those, those peers that you mentioned. I really don't think about legacy at all yet. Maybe one day I'll think about it, but I really don't. Um, there are a lot of guys that came before me that I respect tremendously for what they did. Um, Zeckendorf obviously changed the city uh, tremendously. Um, you have to tip your hat to just as a pure developer what Harry Macklow has done. Um, just incredibly ahead of his time at various times. If you look back, of course, you look at some of the buildings now and they look dated, but you got to put yourself in his shoes back then. They were groundbreaking. Metropolitan just, Tower, 1984, amazing. 1985. I mean, that broke all possible records and imagination. Yeah, yeah and he really, you, you want to talk about a guy who had balls and vision. Um, you know, you got to tip your hat to those who came before you. And Harry Macklow is definitely one of them. Um, and, and, and there are a number of other people, but I really, I, I, I get excited more about the project. I, I, I tend not to, to really worry as much about what other people are doing other than just, you know, um, checking in and seeing, seeing as a barometer what other people are doing. Um, so I, I don't know how to really answer that, but if, you, if, you, if I had to pick one that I say was the most visionary, um, it, it's, a, it's a toss up between Zeckendorf and MacLau, I think. Well, that's an amazing place to be at, right? And I've seen some quotes about you. I've seen some people, you know, talking about you and 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 belonging to that club is definitely something that they feel you're part of. And I was also heard, you know, he's the kind of guy that's, you know, he's basically no guts, no glory. You know, he's out there. He, he you know, developers are brash. Developers are bold. Developers are fearless in a way. I mean, to put all this on a line over and over again and take those chances um, is, is a huge thing. And I think that that's what makes them a breed apart. Um, on, your, on your website, you call yourself a skyline disruptor. Is that, is that how you would describe yourself? That's pretty fair, actually. I didn't even know that was on my website. So um, I learned something. Uh, it's among, it's among like other it. things. Also visionary and historians and, and, and designers, but that's, that's one thing that caught my eye. Yeah, you know, I think that if you look at our buildings, um, I think that's fair because they just look different than what everybody else is doing. Um, you know, you look even now today, the facade is, I don't know, 10 stories up on 9 DeKalb. Um, it, it looks so good, it's surreal. Of course, I'm biased, but it it's just a breed apart. It's very different. You look at American Copper, you look at 111 West 57th, they're buildings that hopefully makes you stop in your tracks and go, what the hell is that? 
um, in a good way, hopefully. And and by the way, I'm also okay taking some some taking a position and taking a design risk. And somebody could say, hey, I don't like what you did there, but at least you didn't build a widget, and at least you took a position. And very often I see buildings that somebody else does, and you know whether I like the building or not isn't the point. But I'll tip my hat and go. I, I really re appreciate and respect what you did. I mean, I'll give you a great a great example. His buildings I actually really like. I think he's does the best masonry buildings um, maybe in the city. Joe McMillan at DDG. You know, he takes great, he takes, great he takes risk. Right, great great designer. And again, whether some people love it, hate it, some people love hate my buildings. You have to respect that he he takes a position, and I think he does beautiful work, and it's very different. And um, and I and I, I respect that. You know, somebody who just builds another ho hum, mid rise setback building. You know, with a panelized brick facade and a P tech. I don't know if I'm going to work on something for four years or three or five. I need to like it because the days that it's not fun, and there are a lot of them, I need to at least be working towards uh, something that's going to make me happy at the end. Well, that's great. And on that note, uh, Michael, I, um, I I admire your work. I think you're doing incredible work for the city. Um, I love your buildings. I love your design. I love your structure as a company and, uh, and your vision and your execution is admirable. So thank you very much for contributing to us as a city and to the skyline as well. I think you're doing incredible work and it's, it's great to hear that you're so still full of passion and full of energy and creativity uh, and with an eye to the future. That's really great uh, to know. And I want to thank you very much for really being so generous with your time with us today. Um, thank you very much for your time. I know our audience, uh, you know, has been um, in a way also educated by some of the stuff that you said here today. And I know that they're very appreciative as well. My so pleasure. Thank, thank you for having me. And thank uh, you. what am I going to do? Take a nap. I got to work. I'm sorry. What? I said, what am I going to do? Take a nap. I got to work. Well, that's the attitude, right? That's the yeah, attitude. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody else, for watching today. See you next time.